My name is Alex, I'm a fourth year physics lab physics student at the University of Exeter. Um, the talk I'm giving today is a basic overview of the study of exoplanets, so the planets will take up star systems. So first, the why is a planet? Now, the ancient Greeks called them morning stars, because if you look up at the night sky, compared to the constellations and the other stars, the planets seem to move across the sky like the moon would. And in the ancient world, before the use of telescopes, we had only known about five of the planets. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And then, around the 19th century, the, the telescope allowed us to discover more. So in 1846, then Neptune was discovered, and based on the orbit of Neptune, we, know, we kind of worked out, okay, there must be some other body far in the solar system causing Neptune to orbit in a peculiar way. That's how we discovered the Uranus, based on the mathematics, and then subsequent observations confirmed it. So there's Uranus and Neptune, so you have Uranus on the left, as it's orbiting at a sort of angle of 90 degrees, so instead of going like that, on its axis, it's more going like this. And you have the wind, and then you have Neptune. So what people often ask, why isn't Pluto a planet? It was considered a planet for a long time, so why not? So in 2006, the International Astronomers Union defined a planet as the following. The body mass orbit the sun. It has a mass large enough to, to <coughs> self-gravity. So by self-gravity, it's causing the planet to, to become a sphere. So you don't get no mind puff like box holes. And it's clear the neighborhood of one its orbit. Now Pluto does not it does not meet that final category. And the reason for that is if you think of the planets orbiting the sun, each planet has its own like orbit plane. And normally what happens if, if a planet is bigger than that, it'll push everything else out of its lane due to its gravity. But Pluto doesn't Pluto is too small to actually do that, so there's other dwarf like planets which are in the same sort of orbital lane as Pluto and other input planet decimals. So, what are exoplanets? Like I said, these are planets which orbit stars other than the sun. And according to the IAU, the definition of an exoplanet is the object with a mass not large enough to see nuclear fusion, so that puts for us sort of an upper limit on the mass. If the planet was any bigger, it would, t it would be able to fuse small elements like hydrogen together to form heavy elements, thus allowing it to. to to sustain its mass, that's making it a star. And it must be bigger than what we can classify a planet in our solar system, i.e. there's no planet the size of Pluto. And the object must be a star, because what you sometimes find is over time, a star system may form, but one of the planets loses, gets sort of pulled out of that star system, so you have what called wandering planets, these are planets so one that across the cosmos alone, basically. And the first confirmed exoplanet was discovered in 1988. Since then, we've discovered over 5,000 different exoplanets, all very different from one another and all unique in their own ways. So the first part of this talk is going to be about, OK, how do you actually detect exoplanets, and how do you actually learn some things about them? And then in the second half, I'll talk about some interesting exoplanets. So, this image here was taken in Death Valley in the United, in the United States. And it's a national park and one house, no light pollution watch there, so you have a, a lovely night sky full of stars. And compared to a star, a planet is about a million times fainter. So to find a planet next to a star, it's like trying to find a, hay, a needle in a haystack. So how do we actually detect them? Well, they have many different methods, and these are some of the most successful methods shown in the pie chart. So the first major sort of successful method has been transit, where you look at as it planet causes across the face of a star and sort of cause changes in the brightness of the star. We also have the radial velocity method, which basically looks at the planet is going to pull on the star and start pulling the planet. So there's going to be a bit of wobbling of the star so you look for that bubble, which is allowed us to infer the existence of the planet. Now, I'm not going to talk about microlensing, it's not going to put direct imaging. Microlensing is basically this phenomenon where 
if you can do and the and the exercise, you have some sort of large skull, large like collection of mass, it's gonna bend them like like a lens or to just magnify the image. But the right imaging is more interesting nowadays but it's where you actually take a photo of the exoplanet. And all these different methods are different things about the planet. So first off, what is the transit method? So on the right you have this animation boost by NASA showing what happens to the star if a planet crosses across the constellation star. So if you just watch it, you've got a large blue planet and a small red planet. And then underneath you have a graph of the brightness of the star as a function of time. Now, as it crosses across the face of the star, you see those dips in the brightness. So, the size of the dip tells you something about the size of the planet. And if you measure for a long period of time, so you get multiple dips caused by the exoplanet, if you say, okay, how long apart can these dips occur? You, you then walk down, okay, then how long does it take the star to over the sun so you know what it is on the planet? And if you know that, you can estimate how far away the planet is from the star. And when the planet points across the face of the star, the planet's own atmosphere will leave an imprint on the light we receive. That allows it to form something called spectroscopy. Now, stars emit light in the form of a sort of black body. Now, this is basically meaning that it's a continuous spectrum of light with no betrayal goes to zero, and it's a curve like this. If you go to higher temperature, this is what you have is the will that this peak occurs will go to shorter wavelengths, and it's now going from the vertical, it will go into the ultraviolet and the X ray and gamma ray parts of the spectrum. So if you if you have a star and you measure the wave, this spectrum and you know the wavelength that the peak occurs, you can also then work on the temperature of the star. So for example, if this is, the this is the spectrum of the sun. And if you compare that to the black body, you notice these sort of dips in the blackness where it drops. Does anyone know what the reason for this is? So these are called absorption lines, and it's basically the sun's own atmosphere absorbing some of the light. So if we consider, like, in chemistry, the simplest element is hydrogen. The hydrogen consists of a proton with one electron opening around it. So we have is this white line and this white line represents more different states that the electron can appear in. So if the electron gets energetic enough, it can jump up. So it can get that energy from the incoming light. Now in this case, the light is quite low energy, more red and orange light. So it passes straight through it, the electron does not absorb it. But if we change the light to, to a, say, blue light, the wavelength of the energy of this blue light matches the gap in, this, in these, in these uh, states. So the electron will then absorb it jumping up. So what you have in the spectrum is that some wavelengths, there's going to be specific elements which will absorb some of that light. It's a roll of dips coming from them. So what you basically have is every element leaves a chemical fingerprint which you can find the spectrum of the star. So that's for example how Norman Lockyer discovered helium in the sun before we knew about its existence or not. So those black lines in, say, this spectrum here are what we call absorption lines. And here, for example, are the spectrums of advanced different stars. Now, fans of Harry Potter may recognize some of these names, Sirius, Regulus. So in Harry Potter, the black family are named after stars. But this, so how can we use this in helping us find exoplanets? Now, an exoplanet, the light emits is kind of similar to a star. So you can perform spectroscopy of that light of the planet to work out, okay, what elements exist in that atmosphere is there things like carbon dioxide, methane, which suggests there may, there may be the existence of life on the planet. And you can also work at the temperature of the planet. So back to the transit method, you have that finely transit, but it's going to 
be at hand, remember the plane goes behind the star from your perspective. So during that time, you get clean spectrum of just the star. So you can compare the spectrums in transit and out of transit to look at, okay, well, this bit of the spectrum was just due to the planet itself. So like I said, you can ask questions like, what's the temperature from the planet? Well, let's just make up the atmosphere. And all the signs of life present in the planet. Now, the second most successful method is called the radial velocity method. And this relies on what the Doppler effect. So if you had had analysis to earlier, see, kind of explain this effect. But what is this you to? If you have a source of light which is moving towards or away from you, it's going to affect the type of light it emits. So if you watch this animation, what you have is a source of light moving from right to left. If you still have the right hand side of light, the source moving towards you, and the way then for the light is shorter, whereas behind it, you, the light is being stretched thus, giving you longer wavelengths. So if a star is moving towards you, it'll appear wet. If it starts moving away from you, it will appear wetter. But if it starts moving towards you, the light being confessed, that's making it appear blue. So those changing wavelengths then change the wavelengths that those absorption lines are colored. So when people think of the solar system, they like to imagine, oh, you have the planets orbiting the star, and the star is kind of stationary. And in the actual fact, the star and the planet both over a common center of mass. So this animation is showing you for a sun and earth like system. The, that cross there represents where the center of mass is. Now, in the case of the sun, the center of mass is within the sun's radius, so it kind of a. So, the, I mean, like the other day, it would look like the sun station is back, it's not moving towards you, then away from you, towards you, then away from you. But other exoplanets and star systems will also show the same properties. So, this is what we call a radial velocity curve. Now, on this axis here, you have the speed of a star is moving out towards you, towards you, away from you. And this exercise is called 51 uh, Pagasi B. And what's important, cool about this and interesting, this was the first exercise we had ever discovered. This was back in 1988. And the height of this curve can allow you to be some sort of limit on, okay, what is the mass of the planet? So in the case of 51 Pagasi B, we know that the mass has to be either equal to or smaller than about 0.47 Jupiter masses. And if you can combine that with observations using the transit method, you can estimate the density of the planet if you know the planet's radius. The planet's going to be a sphere, so you can see work at the volume, and then you can sort of work at the densities in. Okay, if the density is this value, what sort of composition would be expected of the planet? Is it like a gas giant? Is it a rocky planet like Earth? Now this is, using James Webb, this is what's going to be more interesting moving forward, the direct imaging technique. So this is a exoplanet system called HR8799. This blue dot here represents where the star would be. And we've blocked the light to allow us to see four fainter exoplanets labeled B, C, E, and D. And what you this, this sort of scale is 20 astronomical units. So it's so for these exoplanets, like some of them are orbiting up at over 20 times the distance than the Earth orbits the Sun. The challenge with this method is you, the atmosphere is moving, so you've got to maintain those effects using adaptive optics. You are somehow block the light of the star, and then in post-processing, you can fix any leftover starlight. Then back down, if you directly image the planet, you get a much better and cleaner spectrum. And using gene spread, you can also try and image the protoplanetary disks of very young planets or massive stars, which allows you to learn more about how stars and planets form in their very early lifetimes. So this diagram here basically you how adaptive optics works. So what you have is your distant distant star and the atmosphere has stored the, the way you front, so the image doesn't, doesn't appear as best as we can. So the image comes into our telescope, it hits a defoldable mirror, which sends it towards where you would have your detector. 
they have replaced a beam splitter which allows some of the light, about 50%, to go into a control system. So the way that works is you have the incoming deformed light, and the computer will say, okay, the light is deformed like this. So if we deploy counter measures using the deformed mirror, we can correct those rate bumps, thus producing a much better image. That deformable mirror it operates around 10 to 100 times per second. So you may ask, okay, what's the effect of using adaptive optics? These again are pictures of Uranus and Neptune. On the left you have without adaptive optics, and on the right you have with adaptive optics. What I want to draw your attention to is pick some Neptune. Now if you look at the image on the right which uses adaptive optics, you can see a bunch of tracks there and some dots in the plane there which you can't see on Earth. So you have a much cleaner image of the planet. The next thing you want to do is block the solid. So in 1941, Bernard Lert, a French astronomer, wanted to make some observations of an elder sun called the Cor called the Corona. So to do that, he invented the corner graph, which allowed him to block some of the stars like and only see the corona. But what we've done is we've adapted that principle to use for exoplanets. So and what basically happens is the light comes in, hits a mirror, and the mirror sends it back up like this. And then the second mirror sends it back down, and that bit basically blocks 95% of the stars light. And then we use a outer ring in the central dish to blocking that's being bent along along that second mirror. Then we just send the light into our canvas. So this is kind of an interesting block because what I saw is you are the demographics of exponentially discovered. So along this horizontal axis you have the distance between the star and the planet. And going up you have the planet's mass. On this scale it's in units of, of north mass. Over here it's in the units of Jupiter mass. And what you notice you've got this sort of large empty white space where you've not discovered anything. So using James Webb, what we would like to do is try and discover satellite planets at a wide orbital separation. So now we're going to talk about James Webb. So it makes the telescope special. Well, if you're trying to find, say, an off planet, planet, and the temperature of the orbit is about 300 Kelvin, so that's about, that temperature is about 27 degrees, so it's a bit hotter than the Earth, but it's good for this purpose. It means that the peak of an Earth like black body would occur on 10 microns, so which is in the near infrared part of the spectrum. <coughs> we also want to be able to form stuff possibly to study the exoplanet's atmospheres to know, okay, what is the composition. So using web, the instruments are tuned to the near and the mid infrared. And also by putting by being a space telescope, the Earth, it's hot. And there's a lot of thermal noise. So that if you go to the cold vacuum of space, you don't have to compete with any sort of thermal noise of the Earth. Also, space is a vacuum, so you've got no atmospheric turbulence. And using where we can see much fainter exoplanets than telescopes like the very large telescope in Chile. So both telescopes use direct imaging, but using where we much fainter ones. Like I said, we should be able to see Saturn like planets at wide orbital separation. Now we get to the most of exoplanets, now we know like, how we get some <coughs> physical parameters. So this is an X ray called 51 uh, at NEB. So this was captured using the Gemini Planet Imager. And the team has found this captured this video. So we have this black sort of works into the stars, and this opening round is black. And it's just a bit of a speck of light, but it's really fascinating, like what, even as a speck of light, what type of information you can get from this dot of light. So, we have a Jupiter-like planet, and it orbits a young F-type star. So what's the planet like? I mean, first of all, if you, if you look at, by how you have the, the actual date that the observations were made, the planet only moved by about like 10 degrees, but it's taken it three years. So the planet's about 2.6 to 11 times more mass than Jupiter. 
and it always have like 11 a year away. So a year of this plant lasts 10,000 days to make the of six, uh, 355 days. And then the amps have, so it's got 427 degrees Celsius, and it's warm. <laughs> and we also discovered a very strong methane signal chain in the spectrum. The thing about methane, it doesn't last in the atmosphere for a long time. So if there's strong methane presence for a long time, it means there's something on the planet causing it to be emitted. On all side of the planet, it emits methane, probably not cows. So it could be potential for life. There's also water being present. And using atmospheric models, we know it has a low surface gravity and a partly cloudy atmosphere. So the next one is what's nice XP, and this was detected using the transit method. And it's a gas giant, and it's about half a Jupiter mass, but 12 times Jupiter radius. So <coughs> you have very low density. And it, I think very tense to this, it orbits about one twentieth of the distance that the Earth orbits the Sun, and a year lost three and a half days. And this is just going back in 2014 using the WASP mission. This above was it was one of the first targets for James Webb. And what James Webb did was a used spectroscopy to to produce this graph. So what you saw is the amount of light being blocked by different elements. And also this that there's water present. But we know from the sake of this graph that there, there may be haze and, haze and clouds on the planet. Who's on this system? Promise one. It's a really famous example of excellence. Covers one is an exoplanet, it's a system of exoplanets, which was discovered in 2017, and what we discovered there were seven old black planets orbiting a star called Trappist one. And they're all over to a six AU of an optical red dwarf star. And we think around three of the planets would be in the star's haplo zone, meaning you'd have water in the liquid form. So I'm also going to how close these planets are, they're tidy locked. Where you have it at the same side of the planet always faces the, the star. So you have the Mount E here, which takes 6.10 days to orbit. It's about 0.92 of radius and about 0.6 of mass. But it's in the half of the zone, and we think it's been there for a long time, so it's likely to retain water in a liquid form for a very long time. Now, one F on its own is too far away from the star to have liquid water. But we've detected CO2 on the atmosphere, um, as you'll know, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It's going to heat up the atmosphere, and that's stopping the planet from being a snowboard, so it's going to retain some of its water. And like I said, fewer plants in the half of zone, so there's few plants which may have life. If life doesn't exist on the system now, what's really interesting and cool is that star type, it's an auto cool red dwarf star. So because it's such a small star, it's going to last for a very, very long time compared to the sun. So that may not exist now, but it's going to be stable and helpful for, I think, for like, I think around a trillion of years. So there's more than ample time for life to evolve on that planet. Now, it's the 89773B. I should mention a bit about the naming conventions. The word basically refers to what mission discovered it. The number is the basic number in the catalog saying, okay, it's this discovery made. And the letter says, okay, in that star system, what planet is it that we've discovered? It's like A being the closest, B being the second closest, so on and so on. So this was discovered way back in 2005 using the transit method. It's a bit bigger than Jupiter, and, and this is like an artist's impression of the planet. And we see the planet's quite blue, and it looks like there's probably some clouds and a bit of wind on the planet. So it looks, it may be a nice place to live. And the planet reflects a little light more than the red light, which causes that. Now the planet is so luminous and so close to the Earth that we've actually been able to produce a temperature map. So this map basically shows the average temperature of the planet. So like I said, it's a time of this planet. It's the same, uh, the same face always faces Earth. Now what, what we expect is that the hot spot would be dead in the center. So does anyone know why this has been shifted to the right of it? Anyone got any ideas? 
So we have this experiment. I mean, sorry for like getting your hopes up. The temperature is around 844 degrees Celsius. But we have a wind of up to 5,000 kilowatts per hour. So you got common day side, common night side. So you got a common hot side and one cold side. And as you know, heat turns flow from a hot region to a cold region. So the wind is so strong that it's pushing the hot spot to the right. And then this last part is a bit scary. Rains of glass. So on oh no, it rains water because you have your water in the ocean and the, the temp temps of the ocean are enough to so we heat the water up and you get a water cycle. But because of the temperature it's so hot that it's basically heating up sun, the sun rises and then it fall, falls in glass. I got to use another bad fact about this actual flag. That wind speaks, it's 5,000 miles per hour. So you've got glass falling like that, but it's been caught in the wind, so it's going to drive it like that. So if you're standing, you're going to, you're going to get hit by glass, constantly blowing like that. So even though the pilot look nice, I mean, it's a hard show. <laughs> <laughs> this exercise is really interesting for me and anyone else, and we must have that. So this is hit six. 6546B. And this is the first direct image of an expert taken using James Webb. So, an expert, one of the professors is uh, an expert expert called Sasha Hinckley, and he's a private investigator for James Webb. So, him and a team of 100 astronomers from Cuspid captured these images. So, we have two images taken in the infrared and two images taken in the mid infrared. The star symbol is where the star is, and the speck of light is the planet. And the planet is super Jupiter, is a mass of seven times Jupiter. And it, and it orbits about 100 times what the Earth orbits the Sun, and it's 10,000 ta times fainter than the first star. So, I wonder how difficult was it to take a photo of this exoplanet? So, the other difficulty is that. Time Taking a whole fresh water firefly next to the lighthouse, really sort of 50 miles away. And this is an extract from the paper. I'm not going to bore you with the deal, this, but this will be a key sort of extract from it. In the contrast of the regime below approximately two arc seconds, we observe similar influence upon the predicted contrast of the ADI and RDI. So, fractions demonstrate the fact of the 10 times deeper contrast. So ADR and R, ADI and RDI are basically like different ways of imaging the exoplanet. So it is saying that due to it, it's been 10 times better than we expected based on our models. And this day only came out in September, so there's not much I can say to definite, but we've been able to model the atmosphere. And we think at the depths of around 1400 degrees Celsius and a radius of 0.9 Jupiter. So, this is the final experiment to talk about, was 49B, also called Bokrakians. And it's a Jupiter exoplanet, it takes about four days to orbit its star. Temps about 900 degrees Celsius, and like you said, boiling hot. But what's interesting is the mass is like 1.2 Jupiters, but the radius is 1.27. That's given a density of around 180 kilograms per cubic meter, which is actually more than the density of Saturn. With Saturn, if you don't know, if you had a massive bath tub for Saturn on in the bath, it's going to float. So what James Webb said was another sort of that transmission spectrum, and he's confirmed that there's that there's carbon dioxide existing on the exoplanet. So I've heard about some various different exoplanets, and like I said, it's, you've shot 5,000, so this seems like a key sort of question to end on, are we alone? <laughs> so there's about 100,000 million stars in the Milky Way, and we've got a most star system at times so we them. So if you stay from the Kepler mission, which was an exoplanet mission, the number of Earth like times is to be around 300 million to upwards of 40 billion in the Milky Way. So based on the statistics, it seems like life exists. So why have we discovered it? So in 
astrobiology, there's quite a famous equation called the Drake Equation. What the equation gives you is the number of civilizations that could possibly exist in the Milky Way which would be capable of receiving and transmitting radio communications. So if there's intelligent life, you need, you need there to be enough time for life to evolve and form civilizations, and enough time for the civilizations to form radio communications. So one of the sort of great science communicators, communicators was Carl Sagan. And in Carl Sagan's so cosmos, when he talked about the Drake Equation, he found this term called technological, technological adolescence. And what this basically means is if you give enough time for a civilization to form radio communications, you're also likely to, fo to like, form things like nuclear energy or bioengineering. So where you're focused on the civilization has developed those technologies, but has grown to a point where it can use them for power of good and not destroy itself before it starts sending out signals to the cosmos. But if, suppose, there's no other intelligent life in the Milky Way, at least we have a to a point where we exist on a walk drifting through space where we can ponder and ask questions like these and ask questions of our own existence. So uh, thank you for listening. You've got the SpaceX social media is there. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them.